He's the author of multiple award-winning books, including Rubicon, The Triumph and the Tragedy of the Roman Republic, Pax, The Definitive History of Rome's Golden Age, and Dominion, which tells the epic story of how those in the West came to be what they are and why they think the way they do. Tom is a presenter of BBC Radio 4's Making History. He has written and presented a number of TV documentaries for the BBC and Channel 4 on subjects ranging from ISIS to dinosaurs. He is also co-presenter of the Top 10 podcast, The Rest is History. Any fans of that here today? Very quiet fans, but good to have fans here, all nonetheless. We have two of his books available on the bookstand office, which he's willing to sign for you as well. But no further ado, let's give a round of applause for Tom Holland. So, Tom, you're just back, I think, from Copenhagen, is that right? I am, yes. What have you been doing in Copenhagen? Uh, I had to give a talk there, and um, uh, my wife is a big, big fan of a basically kind of chilly Lutheran cities, uh, so she loves them, so she wanted to come along as well, so we had a kind of three-day break there. It's a kind of romantic weekend with a bit of work thrown in, a kind of uh, Absolutely, mix yes. up, that's yeah. good. I thought we'd start a little bit with a fast-fire kind of question round, is that okay? <laughs> if okay, you must. First of all, fast and furious. First of all, cricket or football? Uh, well, I like them both, but cricket. Podcasts or TV series? Podcasts. Wolves or Villa? Villa. Uh, Rome or Athens? Ooh, Rome. Italian food or Greek food? Greek. Spanish beach or Scottish Highlands? Sp uh, Scottish Highlands. High church or low church? I'm afraid high. Old Sorry. <laughs> Old Testament or New Testament? Mm, I, the Old Testament is more fun. <laughs> There's a lack of people having tent pegs hammered through their heads in the new. There are some classic vicious violent moments for sure. So you began writing about vampires, I think, first of all, in your kind of writing career, and, and then you started writing about the church. Um, so how did that journey begin? How did you go from vampires to writing about the history of the church? Well, um, I, I was doing a doctorate on Lord Byron and um, his relationship to classical antiquity, and it, it was terrible. I, Byron is a, a, a poet and figure who's massively unsuited to being written about academically. Um, and I, I came to the conclusion that the best way to pay tribute to him would be to, to write a novel in which he was literally a vampire because he, he, he provides the model for the modern vampire. Yeah. If you think of Dracula, I mean, basically you're thinking of, of Byron. Before Byron, they were all peasants and afterwards vampires become very aristocratic. And I got kind of locked, sold the book and um, it did well enough that, that we got a, I got a three book deal off the back of it. Brilliant. So I, it had never been part of my life plan to be a vampire writer. <laughs> um, and I realized over the process of writing, of writing the succession of four vampire books, all of which were historically focused, that my real passion was, what I really wanted to write about was history. Uh, until that point, I, I thought I wanted to be a novelist, and it took me time to discover what I actually really wanted to do. And so I, um, I began writing about the periods of history that I'd always most loved, which was essentially classical Greece and Rome. Um, and the process of writing about the age of Julius Caesar, say, who is supposed to have, um, uh, killed a million Gauls and enslaved another million and thought it was absolutely brilliant and indeed boasted about it when he staged his, his triumph through um, the streets of Rome. It kind of brought home to me how different the cultural and moral assumptions of the pre-Christian world were. And it took me time to realize that what I was focusing on actually was the fact that uh, Christianity was the, the big seismic revolutionary change between um, the Roman world and our world. And it was a, a perspective that was enhanced for me by writing a book about um, late antiquity. So that's the, you know, Constantine and, and, and the rabbis who authored the Talmud and the emergence of Islam. And the book I wrote was quite skeptical about 
the, the traditions and stories told about the origins of the Quran and, and, and the life of Muhammad. Um, and so I got a fair bit of blowback uh, yeah. on that. And essentially, to keep my head above water with all the criticism, I really had to immerse myself in, in um, Islamic history and thinking. And I, I, I found it much more alien than I had anticipated. And so that sharpened for me again the sense in which I came from a, a very distinctive cultural tradition. And I remember um, giving a talk and there were questions afterwards and a Muslim woman asked me, what, you know, why have I, why was I so skeptical about Muslim traditions? Why had I done it? And, and I would never do this to my own traditions. And I, th I thought, because the traditions that I held to at that point really were that I was uh, an atheist, that um, I was, uh, I didn't believe in God, therefore, when I wrote about the origins of Islam, I didn't believe that an angel could possibly have spoken to Muhammad. And my conclusions, therefore, it seemed to me, were, were neutral. But of course, they weren't neutral at all, because not believing in God is as much a belief position as believing in God. And I was kind of, even before the, the, the woman in the audience had, had pressed me on this, I was already thinking, well, I'm not neutral. Um, where do my traditions come from? And I had assumed that they came from the Enlightenment, but I was already starting to think that that you know that I'd been kidding myself, and that in a sense, just as uh, you know, if I was going to deconstruct the narratives told about the beginnings of Islam, it, it was my responsibility to deconstruct the stories and traditions that were told about the origins of, of secularism and. Um, liberalism and agnosticism and so on um, and that took me back to the Reformation and then from the Reformation back to um, the early Middle Ages and back to the back to Christianity and so I came to write Dominion with the aim of stress testing the feeling that I had increasingly come to that that I and basically the society in which I'd grown up in were fundamentally Christian um, and that atheism and the Enlightenment were simply uh, recent manifestations of what was fundamentally a Christian story. Brilliant. So over the last few weeks you've been doing a very different talks in different church settings. Do you find it strange then when Christians now want to hear your viewpoint on stuff, having done all this research, that strange thing? Or was that obviously you well, were here last week? So when I, um, when, I, when, when I came to sell this to my publisher, yeah. up until that point, it had all been Romans and Vikings and, you know, brilliant. And I said, I want to do one on the history of Christianity. And there was a visible blanching. <laughs> and my, my editor, who, uh, I mean, he, he uh, so the, the, you will notice on the cover of this, if you get to see it, that um, there are, you know, there's Hitler, there's the Beatles, there's Martin Luther King, there's a pillar. Uh, Jesus is not on it. And the very first one, I mean, there was even less Christian stuff on it. Yeah. Uh, I demanded the addition of an angel and a church, which I, I thought, you know, you can't write a history of Christianity and not reference them. And, and he gave it the subtitle that it has in Britain, which is The Making of the Western Mind, because he didn't want to have any hint on the cover that it was actually about Christianity. In America, there's a massive great picture of Jesus on the cross, and the subtitle is How Christianity Changed the World. <laughs> so, I mean, it tells you a lot about the, the, you know, the, the, the differences market. between Britain and America in their attitudes to, um, to, to, to Christian history. Um, he... He, he was kind of nervous about it. Mm. Uh, actually, no, I've completely forgotten what your question was. I've spiraled off. Great. No, it was great. It was what good. was your question? I'm I, not sure now, but it was good. <laughs> well, anyway. Um, so in the book, you kind of explore really how then this tiny Jewish sect changed the Western world. Just in that initial period, those first 300 years, how did the message of Jesus and this small group of disciples tip the balance for the, Christ for the Roman Empire to become Christianized? What, how did that happen? Well, that, I mean, that is, the, that is the great question, isn't it? Hmm. Um, and I, I imagine that, I mean, the, 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 the Christian's answer to that is, of course, that it's the manifestation of the Spirit yeah. and that um, it, it, it reflects God's plans. And 
this was our, you know, the, the merging of this understanding with the facts of history is very, very ancient. So um, Eusebius, the first great historian of the church, writing in the time of Constantine, and he writes about Constantine. And he says uh, that it's clearly no coincidence that um, God ordained um, the, the coming of Jesus into the world in the reign of Augustus, who had brought peace to the entire world, mm. because this peace had then enabled the apostles to spread across the world. Now, I think there is some truth in that <laughs> argument, because um, nothing comes from nothing. Christianity is like a great, sea that is fed by numerous rivers so obviously um, the uh, the legacy the Hebrew scriptures um, Greek philosophy uh, Zoroastrian traditions of, of, of moralizing the universe but also Roman universalism and the fact that um, this there is it is possible to think in a, a universalizing globalizing way which is the whole basis of Roman propaganda. This is something unique. It had never happened before that the whole Mediterranean was under the rule of, of a single power. And the shipping lane, so when Paul you know, gets sent to Rome from Judea, uh, even though he gets shipwrecked, you know, he's not being attacked by pirates um, because the Romans have cleared the Sea of Pirates. Or when he's going on his trips to um, Galatia or Athens or Corinth or whatever, you know, he's using roads that are maintained by Roman power, rather in the way, I guess, the kind of subversive way that, um, that the internet came to be used by people who were very hostile to American imperialism. Mm. So um, I, I think that there is that kind of material basis that it's operating within a globalized structure that had not previously existed. And of course, its message is one that is very appropriate to the universal. It, 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 so, so the idea of there being something called Judaism is very anachronistic. There isn't. It's, it's a Christian way of conceptualizing it that, it that emerges in the second century. But no Judean would have, would have said that there was something called Judaism to which they belonged. But what there is, of course, is, is, is something called Judaismos, which is what it is to be a Judean, mm -hmm. in the same as Hellenismos, what it is to be a Greek. And... It's it best thought of, I think, as a kind of bandwidth. And at one end, there, are, there is the, um, the, the, the principle which Judaism will inherit, which is the idea that uh, God has chosen one people in particular. And at the other end, there is the, the idea that God has created all human beings in his image, and therefore all human beings have a particular dignity. And this is what Christianity will propagate. And it proves to be a, a teaching that is hugely popular with people because it is, it is, there's an incredible appeal for, for Romans in Judean teaching, but for men in particular, there's obviously a huge problem that they have to have an operation. Yeah. Whereas with Christianity, for instance, you don't. So there's yeah. that advantage. But then above all, I think, there, there is the fact that Christianity offers to people across the empire, um, a, a dignity that no would-be universal teaching had done before. Mm. Um, and in a world without a welfare state, to have teachings that imagine um, a, a, a God who has said, you know, if you give water to a thirsty person, you're giving it to me. Uh, if you give shelter, if you give food, if you give whatever, clothing or whatever, you suck up someone in prison, you're doing that for me. There's an obvious appeal in a society that has no conception of that kind of welfare. So that by the time that Constantine converts, effectively, the church is running the, the, the world's first welfare state. And it's nothing to do with the Roman state. It's a kind of massive cuckoo in the nest. Um, and you can see why that would, that would have an appeal to people who um, otherwise are not going to get that uh, that sense, so not, and it's not just of, of welfare, but of dignity. And I think in, in that period, then the church grew kind of incrementally, year by year. Or there were suddenly bursts and starts. What are your, your thoughts on on in that period? I think I think it probably. I mean, it's very difficult to tell, so it's much debated. I think it probably gets a, a, a big stimulus in the wake of the destruction of Jerusalem, 
which happens um, in 70 AD. Uh, and again, with the, um, the, 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 there's another terrible war in the reign of Hadrian, which results in the, the, the name Judea gets wiped from the map and replaced with Palestina, Palestine. So that's obviously a development that continues to reverberate into the present. Um, there is a very convincing argument that um, in the third century there are a whole series of, of devastating plagues and that the Christian commitment to caring for the sick is, firstly, it enables those who have fallen ill, who are Christian, to survive um, in a way that those who, who are not being tended to are less likely to, but also it, it impresses mm. people. And there seems to have been a spike across the third century. Um, and it's evident by the time that, that Constantine converts that he is, I mean, he, I think he is genuine, he's genuine in it. I think he, ha he has a vision, and he then spends the rest of his life trying to understand what it is that he's signed up to. But he's also a very hard-headed politician, mm -hmm. and he recognizes that um, just as Christianity offers something for the, for the poor and the downtrodden, so it offers something for, for him, for Caesar. He's a man who wants to rule the entire world, and essentially he wants a God who is appropriate to that ambition. Mm -hmm. And the one God of the Christians basically passes his audition. Does the trick. So you've touched it already, already but um, can you give a, a synopsis of two or three ways in which then the Christian faith has influenced the Western mindset and how we think in the West? I, I barely know, I mean, everything. I mean, there is almost no aspect that it hasn't influenced. I would say that over the past, what, 1500 years since um, Constantine's conversion, if you are within the heartlands of Christian Europe, um, the only really counter-Christian, well, there are two counter-Christian, big, broad-brush counter-Christian um, developments. The first is Darwinism, which I think is genuinely subversive of Christian teaching. I know that Darwin never said survival of the fittest, but that is, you know, the implication of what he is saying. Um, you know, if you are, I don't know, um, less less fit, less able to survive, then you are unlikely to be looked after in the wild, and that is, uh, I think, a genuinely threatening perspective on Christian assumptions. And the other one is Nazism. Um, so even the French Revolution and the Russian Revolutions, which are very hostile to institutional Christianity, nevertheless have at their heart fundamental Christian doctrines, of which an obvious one is the notion that the last shall be first, mm -hmm. and indeed the first shall be last. I mean, both of them are completely yeah. committed to that, and both of them are committed to a notion of time's arrow, a sense that, um, which is very, very evident in Marx, that there is a kind of, um, a, you know, an end of days when an equivalent of a new Jerusalem will be built and, and all shall be well. Uh, and so in that sense, both the French and the Russian revolutions are going with the grain of Christian teaching. What is so radical about fascism, and fascism, of course, takes its name from the bundle of rods that the guardians of Roman magistrates wore on their shoulders, is that it is simultaneously looking back to the pre-Christian world of Rome in particular, but also classical Greece, uh, and forwards to a supposed post-Christian world where all will be steel and speed and modernity. And that is why Mussolini is subversive of Christianity. But the real subversion comes with the Nazis because the Nazis place at the heart of their moral understanding of the universe two things that are profoundly antithetical, not just to institutional Christianity, but to Christian teaching. Namely, the idea that um, it is basically better, it's more morally edifying to side with the person who is tortured rather than the person who is torturing. Um, fasc you know, the Nazis despise victims. Um, they see the idea of identifying with the guy who ends up on the cross rather than with the soldiers who've put him there as, as pathetic and contemptible and weak. Um, and the other thing, of course, that they um, repudiate is the notion that is famously summed up by Paul, that there is no Jew or Greek in Christ, but um, 
the Nazis absolutely think that there's a massive difference between Jew and Greek. And indeed, they, they, they blame, I mean, I mean, I think this is the kind of the most grotesque paradox about Nazism, and there's so many grotesque paradoxes, but in a way, the most grotesque of all is that the Nazis blame the Jews for Christianity. They blame, they see the Romans and the Greeks, certainly their elites, as being Nordic, um, this is how they've managed to build the, you know, the the Parthenon and the the Pantheon, but that they've been corrupted mm. by uh, miscegenation and orientalization, mm. and that Paul is the representative figure of this Jewish hatred for the the nobility and purity of of, of the Nordic race, and you know this is the sanction that they 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 draw on to justify genocide, and the the consequences for us in the present of this I think and for the churches I think has been really devastating mm -hmm. because of what it has done is it has enshrined a new mythology to underpin Christian ideas we don't actually need Christianity anymore to believe that uh, it is wrong to be racist and to despise the poor because we have the Nazis that serve that illustration so whereas before at the 20th century, people would say, you know, what would Jesus do and do it? Mm. Now people tend to say, what would Hitler do and do the opposite of it? Mm. The fact is, we, we still regard Hitler as the essence of evil because we have Christian instincts, because he, he so decisively trampled on, on Christian imperatives. But we don't need the devil when we have Hitler. We don't need hell when we have Auschwitz. And I, I think that it's not a coincidence that church attendance re in Europe starts to fall off a cliff in the 60s when people are able to kind of understand and get a handle on exactly what Europe had been through. So some people would argue, that, I guess, in that the fruits we're living in right now, the values we have in our culture, have, have come from Christianity, but those roots are perhaps eroding in some ways. So if the church fails to grow and continues to influence culture in the years to come, where do you see society in a hundred years' time from now? What could be the uh, so? I th I mean, I, I I I'm not a prophet, <laughs> um, but I think, I mean, I think that there, there are three kind of possible paths, uh, and all of them may may happen simultaneously. So the first is that I think that we at the moment are living through an equivalent of the Reformation, that the 1960s will be seen in the long term as being as historically significant as the 1520s. What this period of change and, and moral evolution will be called, I don't know. You know, it took a, a century and a half for the Reformation to work out that it was a Reformation. Um, but we are going through something like that now. And uh, essentially what has happened is that um, Christian doctrine and um, uh, scripture has been replaced by, by a vibe. And in a way, it was bred of the last great Christian triumph in the, in, 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 in the West, in the dimension of politics, which was the civil rights movement in the United States, which clearly emerged from very, very Christian notions. You know, Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King, um, teaching that Christ was an extremist for love, uh, the whole narrative of, of exodus, of, of the people who had been in bondage, being brought to a, a, a new land, all of this kind of language and imagery inspired the civil rights movement. And it was so effective that it in turn inspired similar campaigns for civil rights, so gay rights, um, feminism, and so on, which was less digestible by Orthodox Christianity. It was, it was tougher to integrate feminism and even more gay rights into traditionally understood Christianity. And so that set up a sense that <coughs> progressives, if, that, if that's what you want to call it, and Christians in the United States began to become polarized. And there was a sense on the Christian side in the, in the United States that um, progressives were, were not just post-Christian but anti-Christian. And that sense of hostility in turn on the progressive side fueled a sense that Christianity and religion generally was something oppressive and reactionary that had to, 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 to be destroyed. And that basically is where the United States is. And because we are an English-speaking country, we are 
so influenced by it mm. that, that, that we live in its shadow as well. But I think that there is no aspect of the culture wars that is not in some sense uh, a, a Christian civil war. It's just that the, the, the whatever it is that we're going through, this kind of progressive sense of, uh, that no longer has the Bible and Christian practice at its heart, but it has Christian instincts at its heart. So if you think of um, the, the, the famous um, death that mobilized America and, and people here and, 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 and very often chiefly in Protestant countries in Europe as well, the death of George Floyd. I mean, what was it about the death of an innocent man at the hands of armed representatives of a great imperial power that, that that generated the 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 kind of the emotions that it did and it's fairly obvious why it would have impacted societies that are christian and that have the image of christ on a cross at its heart but it's as though in our world we have we have the, the, the vibe, we have the instincts, we have the impulses, but we no longer have the narratives that explain those impulses and that, that structure those impulses. And so people are looking around for other sources that will enable them to, to, to uphold the values that, that are clearly so deeply held. Really helpful, really helpful. So I think the church has a role to play now to be kind of in the, our theme this couple of days is in the world but not of the world that we're called as the church to be engaging in society but being different to society and having that kind of Christ likeness as we go about serving our communities and things are there some examples historically of how the church has done that well being in the world but not of the world well I think I mean I think um, uh, right from the beginning I, this sense that as I said that that a welfare state emerges in the in the Roman world is something unprecedented. No one had, no one had done this before, um, and the impulse to to care for, say, the sick, is not a given mm. <laughs> at all, um, and we take it for granted. And I actually think it is a problem for the church that, in a sense, it's triumphed too completely that so much that it used to have to do because no one else would do it has now been nationalized. Mm. I mean, we, you know, the Christians invent the welfare state in the Roman period, but now it's, it's been completely secularized. Mm. And what role do the churches have? Um, I mean, I, it, seemed, it struck me very strongly during the pandemic where the role of bishops seemed to be to shut churches down and to tell people to wash their hands. Um, you know, and washing their hands is always very important. Yeah. But we had multitudes of officious yeah. <laughs> public servants telling us to do that. We didn't really need bishops as well. And it seemed to me that the one thing actually that, that, um, that the churches could give in a time of pandemic and death and, and confusion were kind of reflections on the supernatural context for this. Um, yeah. And there was seemed to me, I mean, maybe it was happening under the water, but but to me, it, that was a, a kind of notable absence. So you've, you've, you've shared often, I think, about the idea that we should, as the church, keep Christianity weird. That yeah. we shouldn't kind of hide away from the weird bits. I guess some of us here will be involved in churches trying to make them as relevant as possible to our communities. But what do you mean by keeping it weird? What does that look like? Any thoughts? So, so to, to, to go back to um, the analogy of what we're going through now with the Reformation, in, so look, say you look at England in, in the 1530s, 1540s, 1550s, 1560s. People from a, from a, a traditionalist background, so raised in, in what will come to be defined as, as Catholic Christianity in the Tudor period, have a choice. They, they can choose to defy the new emergent Protestant order or they can choose to accommodate to it, or they can choose to convert to it completely and become enthusiastic um, proponents of it. Um, I think that Christians of all denominations are in that position now. And they have the pressure 
on Christians to accommodate to the new dispensation is very, very strong. Mm. And the problem with that is it means that Christians are moving to rhythms that are not their own. Mm. And it can kind of express itself as a kind of cultural cringe, as a desire to to seem with the the, the dominant trends of the age, mm -hmm. uh, to to talk about um, pressing issues in the world in the way that they are being articulated by politicians or by um, academics or. Uh, people with very loud voices on Twitter. <laughs> so, so whether it's global warming or Black Lives Matter or, what, or, or trans issues or whatever, these are issues that are bred of the, the, the kind of cultural contours of the past years and decades that although they reflect the deep heritage of Christian assumptions, they have unmoored themselves from Christian teachings and Christian doctrines. And so therefore, it's quite easy for the churches to align themselves with those traditions, but it's also very dangerous because the churches risk losing what makes them distinctive. And it seems to me that what makes the churches distinctive is that they believe all kinds of completely mad stuff. <laughs> so, you know, they believe that there's one God and he became man and he got nailed to a cross and he rose from the dead and angels tended him and, you know, it's all completely bizarre. Um, but if you're not emphasizing that, yeah. what's the point? You might as well just close down and, you know, and go and join a sociology department. Um, <laughs> and I, I, was, I, I went to, I, I mean, I, don't, I, I won't say where it was because I don't want to name and shame, but I, I went to a service um, that was all about caring for the planet, uh, global warming, you know, anxieties about this, how we, sh you know, we should cut back on plastic and all kinds of things. And it was all tremendous. And I, you know, there wasn't a thing in it I didn't disagree with. Um, if it had been David Attenborough on BBC One, I would have thought, brilliant, this is what I paid my license fee for. Um, but since it was in a church, there wasn't a single mention of anything to do with Christianity whatsoever. Now, if, if it had been uh, something about global warming or climate change or whatever in the context of um, the book of Daniel mm -hmm. or Revelation, that would have been brilliant. I'd have been all, you know, I'd have loved that. <laughs> but, and I don't know why there wasn't, because you've got this incredible heritage. You've got, I mean, the Bible is, I mean, it's the most extraordinary assemblage of texts ever compiled. And the heritage of, of Christian teaching, you know, which I spent years reading, I mean, kind of effectively just skimming because there's so much of it, but there wasn't a period of it where I didn't think, this is amazing, it's so rich, it's so profound, it's so interesting. And yet, it's like a kind of huge legacy that, that I think too many people in the churches just ignore. And so I think that, that rather than try and accommodate um, Christianity to essentially a kind of post-Christian way of seeing the world, emphasize what is Christian about it. I mean, it is basically yours. <laughs> I mean, you invented it, most of it. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, but, you know, it's just pe people have kind of nicked it and made it their own. And now you're, you know, I would say you, I'm sure you're no, not. it was but, me personally. But, uh, you know, but... but but basically, just emphasize all the things that, that set you apart good. from what everybody else thinks. Brilliant. Really helpful. Really helpful. So moving on to a kind of more personal note, you grew up, your mum was Church of England, and you kind of grew up going to church, but in your youth you kind of turned your back on the Christian faith. Um, why was that? Is there anything the church should have done differently? I, I didn't turn my back on Christian no? faith. I, I, I've compared it to a kind of, you know, a, a dimmer switch. Yeah. That it just kind of faded away. And the, and the, the, the awful thing is, is that basically I, um, 
I mean, I love the Bible. I love the stories. You asked me wh which did I prefer, the Old or the New Testament. I much preferred the Old Testament because it involved chariots and fighting and <laughs> all that kind of thing. But what I really loved was Greece and Rome. And I, I found the Greek gods m much more charismatic and, and kind of, well, sexy. I mean, you know, kind of, <laughs> kind of cool. And, and honestly, when, I, you know, when I, I, I thought about Jesus in front of Pontius Pilate, I was totally on Pontius Pilate's side. <laughs> I mean, he just seemed, you know, he had the purple and the legions, and it was just brilliant. Um, and <laughs> I kind of identified with Rome. I mean, it's kind of, you know, and this is, this is kind of a, a heresy, but th 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 there's an appeal and a, and, a, and a glamour and a swagger to Roman power mm. that you don't get in the figure of, of some broken scruff nailed to a plank of wood. Mm. Um, and... I was the kind of horrible little boy who preferred preferred Caesar to all our fists and swords. Yeah, exactly, and and so it it just kind of faded. It was blotted out by 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 other interests. But I should say that I never had a, a kind of um, you know a, a kind of reverse road to Damascus. I I I I never became a doctrinaire. Mm atheist who hated Christianity. I always kind of respected it because, because my mother is mm. deeply Christian and so I always, and my godmother as well, who's the dedicatee of this book. Mm. I, I, I kind of loved and admired and respected them. And so I always respected Christian teachings. It's just I didn't believe, believe it. And, and I found it kind of a bit boring, to be honest. And I had a kind of synesthetic sense of the past. I, you know, so Greece and Rome, blue skies, coming Christianity, autumn, drizzle, kind of grey. Yeah, and it's, it's taken me time to completely change my mind of that. You went to Iraq a few years ago and you had quite a profound experience there. Yeah. You had the idea of crucifixion. Do you want to share some of what you experienced there and some of your Yeah, so um, I, I made a film about why um, the Islamic State were doing what they were doing to Christians and the Yazidis and we ended up in this place called Sinjar, which was um, a town right on the front with the Islamic State. So this was 2016. Um, and it had just been recaptured by the Kurds. And by, uh, I don't quite know how it, how, how it happened, but basically we got permission to go there. And it was terrifying, because I, I absolutely would not have gone if I'd known that this was the deal, because I'm a natural coward. But anyway, we ended up going to this place. And it was, you know, it, it, it had been absolutely flattened, and it was a place where Yazidi, me, Yazidi women notoriously had been enslaved, and those who, who were not considered to be sexually attractive had, had been killed, and their, their bones were still kind of littered out beyond the limits of the town. Um, so it was, it was very unsettling and, and, and awful, um, but it was also a place where people had been crucified, Yazidi men had been crucified, and to be in this place where um, uh, two miles away, so within mortar range, there were people who viewed crucifixion as the Romans had viewed crucifixion. Was a, a, you know, it kind of opened up an existential ab abyss for me, because it it brought home to me what it was like to live in a world where the cross did not serve as a symbol of the triumph of the victim over the victimizer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was kind of psychologically, morally um, devastating. And to be in a, world, in, a, in a town that had been treated as the legions would have treated a, a, a town that resisted it, again, it, it really dramatized and sharpened for me an understanding of what the Roman world had been like mm. in a way that n read no number of books or visiting our archaeological sites could ever have done. And there was on top of that uh, an experience of going to a church. So all the, all the non-Sunni mosques had been desecrated. So the Yazidi temples, the Shia mosques, and this church that had been founded by Armenian refugees from the genocide in, in Turkey. So, I mean, such, I mean, imagine that. You escape. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Armenian genocide, and then you end up ruled by ISIS. Um, and the church had been systematically demolished and desecrated. 
They'd taken a, a, a jackhammer to the altar and they had uh, toppled the font and they had smashed all the, um, the icons and the images that had clearly decorated the church. And there was this um, image of the Annunciation that had been trodden down and I kind of picked it up. It was face down, which I think is why it hadn't been destroyed. So there was the picture of, of the Virgin and um, Gabriel. And it, I, I was kind of, I was so dehydrated and, and ill and nervous and twitchy. So I can, I can explain it in entirely rational terms, but it felt like I was feeling the wings of an angel at that point. It felt like I was in one of those thin places where heaven is close and I, I could believe absolutely in angels at that point. Um, so it, it, was, it was an experience that really shaped me. It, it, it clarified an understanding of what the pre-Christian world had been like and it opened up for me a sense of what the world would be like um, where the dimension of the heavenly was accessible and did exist. Wow. Wow. And, and I had just begun writing Dominion at that point. Yeah. I'd written about two chapters and I, I, and I came back from it and rewrote the opening to focus massively on the crucifixion. So the book opens with the crucifixion. So recently you've been going to Evensong every now and again. How would you describe your, I guess, journey and faith and those kind of things for yourself right now? So I, um, when I was writing Dominion, I would go to churches that were appropriate to the period I was discussing. So I, I, went, to, uh, I went to a Ruach on Brixton Hill. I went to Quaker Meeting House. I went to a Reformed Church. I, I went to a Lutheran Church. Um, and for the Middle Ages, I went to St. Bartholomew the Great, which is... Um, a church in Smithfields, um, and it right next to St. Bartholomew's Hospital, both of which were founded by um, uh, supposedly a jester of Henry I, the son of William the Conqueror, who'd gone to Rome and had a vision of St. Bartholomew and vowed that he would come back and build a hospital and, and priory if he, was, if he recovered, which he did. Um, so the hospital's still there. The priory, of course, is swept away in the Reformation, but a chunk of it got left behind um, to serve as a parish church. And so I went there and I, I found it very, you asked me if I was high or low church. I mean, it's very high church. Uh, but I find it very, very beautiful. So I go there whenever I can. Uh, not just even song. I go for 11 o'clock service as well. Um, and I, I'm, I'm kind of in a, a kind of, midway between belief and unbelief yeah thank you for honesty thank you on the slido do we have any questions on the slido they're gonna have any questions come up i think so my uh, helpful assistant here my brother <laughs> okay um what do you think the future of the church looks like and what can we learn from the past Right, I, d I realize I never answered your question about where we were, might be going. So, yeah. so, so, so this, this kind of, this, this transmutation from kind of liberal secularism into progressive whatever it is at the moment, I mean, it, can, it will just continue under its own rocket fuel mm. and, 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 and that will continue. So that's one path. The other path is that as memories of the war fades, um, so the kind of the notion that, that might is right because it's no longer trammeled by Christian teachings, that that's something that, that may come back. So it wouldn't be, I don't think it would be fascism per se, but I think it could be something along those lines. Um, because if you don't have Christian teachings, why, why bother with them? Mm. Um, and the third is, I think that, that, that people probably, I mean, may, and maybe I'm being, um, you know, <laughs> I'm being arrogant and identifying myself with an entire cultural trend, <laughs> but it's possible that people will think that what is being lost with Christian faith is something valuable and try and um, kind of explore it and, and get back to it. So I, I think any, any, any of those possibilities are open, which, me, which suggests I think that there, I, I can imagine, um, I can imagine a rebirth of interest in Christianity. Mm. But I think that for that rebirth to happen, 
it, it has to offer something that you're not getting elsewhere. Mm. And it's fairly obvious what that is. <laughs> but I think in the public manifestations of Christianity, yeah. people are not getting it. Yeah. Really helpful. So one last question. How do you think our walking away from a culture of literacy and into a more digital culture will affect the world? Um, well, I, I, I think that great convulsions and changes in the nature of belief accompany great changes in the way that information is consumed. So again, to go back to the parallel with the Reformation, the Reformation would have been impossible without the printing press. Mm. I mean, there's a kind of astonishing statistic that in the 1520s, something like a quarter of all published material in Europe was written by Luther. <laughs> um, so wow. I may be slightly exaggerating that, but it's kind of on that order. And it means that, um, I mean, I think you can see the way that the internet has massively fueled really radical changes in understanding about mor public morality. You know, it's been kind of ongoing for the past 20 years. So um, I think that, that, that Christianity has to accommodate itself to that, and kind of is. Mm. Um, but I think at the moment that the, um, the just as, it, you know, it, it took Catholics time to catch up with Protestants when it came to the use of the printing press. I think that the, the traditional churches are being left behind by progressives or whatever you want to call them at the moment with with use of the new media mm, really helpful right, round of applause more okay well <laughs> which question next then i'm being heckled by my uh, anyway um okay here you go if you live in a past century which century would you choose to live in and why in a past century yeah well i choose to live in the 20th century because the, the dentistry would <laughs> <laughs> at least you'd be able to find a dentist that's good. I and mean, that's the key thing. Um, good. Didn't see that coming. Um, you say there has never been a belief like Christianity before. Can you imagine another impact like that coming in our time or the future? No. <laughs> no, because, because I think... I mean, the, what, is, what is distinct... It, it, Christianity is not unique. There is Islam as well. So... They are two universalizing understandings of the divine and humanity's relationship to the divine. And they both aspire to be universal. And I don't think that there is, you know, they are so ancient, they are so complex, they are so civilizationally rich that I cannot imagine the space for something equivalent to emerge. So I think it. it what we're going, you know, we still live in a Christian world, yeah. even in, in its kind of post-Christian form. Okay, one last question now, okay? Over there, be quiet. What has been the sceptical, secular response to your views in Dominion? Well, um, <laughs> when, I, when I did my, um, my uh, book on uh, the origins of Islam, I had loads of... of, of support from uh, humanists and, and, and so on. And I think they, they, there was a mild feeling from some of them that I, I slightly betrayed them by saying that they were all Christians. I, I, I think they felt <laughs> that this was not really the, the, the thank you that they'd been looking for. Um, so not wild enthusiasm, I would say. Um, but equally, I mean, there have been plenty because because essentially the, it's not a book of apologetics and it doesn't really make any difference. I mean, it, it seems to me, and, and, and this is something that, that plenty of, of non-believers who've read it and kind of agreed with the argument have accepted, is that, I mean, if you don't believe in God, it doesn't make any difference where your beliefs come from. Hmm. Um, I mean, why, why does it matter if it comes from Christianity? And a lot of atheists, it seems to me, are like Bishop Wilberforce, you know, denying that he, he, he's descended from an ape. Um, likewise, lots of humanists are, are busy denying that they're descended from Christians. Mm. But so what? I mean, I, I don't see, honestly see why they would care. Mm. Um, and, and the fact that so many do care suggests to me that they are basically just um, 
you know, kind of late Protestant sects. <laughs> Brilliant. Round of applause. Like the Church of England, right? <laughs> so round of applause for Tom Holland.